Our next guest for the next half hour is Art Laffin. He has been an organizer, writer, and speaker in the faith-based movement for peace and justice for over 20 years. Again, he has dedicated his life. He currently is a member of the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker House of Hospitality in Washington, D.C. Art's brother, Paul, was associate director of a homeless shelter in Connecticut for 10 years before he was murdered by a mentally ill man in 1991. And Art has been working against death penalty for many years, but even more uh, actively since his brother, um, brother's death. He is involved in plowshares that we were referencing mm -hmm. and the, uh, the um, trial that we've also been touching upon. So, Art, we welcome you to the program for the first time. Thank you very much. It's great to be with you. Let's start off with um, your take on the trial. Uh, I don't know if you've actually participated in it but in Georgia, but uh, update us your perspective. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I was able to attend the trial of the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 in uh, Brunswick, Georgia, which uh, began on October 21st and went through the week and ended on uh on that Thursday, and um, you know, there, there's a long history of uh, uh, plowshares activists going into uh, the courts trying to uh, make the point that uh, if we're going to survive as a human family, we have to outlaw nuclear weapons. And so, our friends, uh, our seven uh, Kings Bay plowshare seven friends. Uh, tried to do that. They tried to put uh, the Trident uh, program, U.S. nuclear weapons policy, on trial. And, uh, you know, as, as these trials go, uh, um, uh, you know, the government always tries to limit the defenses that uh, the defendants put forth. That is, uh, they, they uh, come up with what's called motion and limines, which prohibit any kind of affirmative defense. So, in this particular uh, trial, uh, it, was, it was unique in, in, in the sense that the uh, seven were trying to uh, use the Religious Freedom Restoration Act as part of their defense. But in motions uh, pre-trial, uh, that, that was denied. And uh, also denied were uh, necessity and justification defenses, which, uh, uh, you know, have been used in, in, in other cases but in Plowshare's trials, it's uh, virtually impossible to really uh, establish the uh, illegality of U.S. nuclear weapons policy uh, because of these uh, uh, motions to suppress uh, evidence. And uh, ultimately, a gag, a gag order is essentially uh, issued so that uh, the defendants can't really speak about their true intent. Now, now in this case, the uh, the judge uh, gave a little bit of a little bit of latitude, uh, and and the defendants being able to talk about some of their religious beliefs. But when it came to time for jury instruction, when the judge instructed the jury on the uh, the laws in the case and how they're to be applied, um, they, the judge basically told the jury that they can't consider the defendant's uh, uh, religious beliefs or anything about nuclear weapons or U.S. nuclear policy. And so the defendants, uh, you know, tried during their testimony and opening and closing statements to repeatedly speak about why they acted. And uh, uh, at different times in the course of the trial, they were objected to by the jury by, by the, they were objected to by the uh, prosecutor, and then the uh, judge uh, granted, you know, the prosecutor's objections almost every single time. And, uh, and so what the jury is left with is, uh, you know, whether they uh, conspired to uh, destroy government property, whether they conspired to uh, commit damage of government property, and whether they uh, trespassed. And so... The jury was out less than two hours before finding uh, all seven uh, guilty on all counts, and now uh, they await uh, sentencing. Wow. And so, so uh, 
Even though, even though the uh, the government went to great lengths to try to suppress the uh, truth of their action, uh, it was clear to everybody there were over a hundred uh, supporters from all over the country that were present at the trial. Uh, everybody could, you know, felt very strongly. You know, the defendants were able to uh, articulate. Uh, why nuclear weapons uh, are immoral and illegal and why they should be abolished forever. So, and, uh, and so what we, what, we, what we have now is, uh, you know, the, the, the courts basically uh, using the law to sanction U.S. nuclear policy, you know, and the threat to use nuclear weapons, which is a, an ongoing threat. And... Uh, uh, nonviolent action, uh, like the, the one, the action that our friends took at Kings Bay, Georgia, uh, where six Trident submarines are home ported. Uh, there, there are 14 uh, Trident submarines that are currently operational uh, in the U.S. nuclear arsenal, and the the other uh, eight are based at uh, the Trident base in, uh, in uh, Bangor, Washington, and so. They, they were trying, trying to always, you know, say that, that God's law supersedes human law. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case, the, uh, the trident actually seems to supersede all law. That uh, the, there, there's no opportunity for uh, any accountability uh, from, uh, from, from, uh, from the government, uh, from, from anywhere. And so uh, our friends are trying to, you know, say that, you know, the, the, this this trial, this, uh, the, I believe that these friends should never have been arrested and uh, charged and tried in the first place. They committed a great act of uh, faith and disarmament. Uh, they acted in accordance with God's law and international law. So, Art, uh, so Art so, let, let's leave moral law and God's law out of it for the moment just for the time being. And believe me, I'm with you on that 100%. I'm a guy who wanted to be a uh, Maranel missionary, a Catholic priest uh, when I was a kid. So I'm with you on that. But I just want to focus on, on some of the international law uh, aspects of the case. Why didn't the judge, <coughs> excuse me, why didn't the judge allow a, some kind of defense that... Um, that was connected to um, Trump uh, unilaterally and illegally uh, pulling out of the INF Treaty, which in turn seriously jeopardizes the renewal of the uh, new strategic arms uh, or the new START Treaty between the United States and Russia. Why didn't the judge um, allow some kind of defense uh, that uh, that uh, would have... Uh, uh, focused on the Trump's administration's further violations of international law obligations of the United States under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, uh, which is designed to achieve nuclear disarmament, as interpreted by the International Court of Justice Nuclear Weapons Advisory Opinion. Um, why, why wasn't some of these violations of international law allowed into the defense? Well, that's that's a very good question. I so I've participated in two of these postures actions directed at the Trident submarine in uh, in Groton and New London, Connecticut, where all the Tridents have been built. And uh, in the Trident nine trial uh, back in 1982, we had uh, former Attorney General Ramsey Clark uh, as a uh, as a witness uh, that. He was not allowed to testify before the jury about the applicability of international law and treaties that are binding on uh, U.S. law. And uh, here, here we have uh, all these years later uh, the same thing happening. You know, uh, uh, our friends brought into the uh, Trident base the uh, the book about uh, from Daniel Ellsberg. Um, the Doomsday Machine, you know, which which outlines U.S. secret nuclear war preparations uh, from the very beginning, and uh, the the uh, the fact of the matter is that the the court the court will uh, 
not allow these uh, uh, violations of international law and the applicability of international law to be admitted into evidence because if they do, that means that nuclear weapons uh, are are illegal. That that any any uh, well, let's start with our country. You know, the U.S. government is engaging in criminal activity by possessing them mm-hmm. and threatening to use them. And so it would, it, you have a situation where the judiciary would have to indict the executive and legislative, legislative branches of government for criminality. Um, so this is what we're up against. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you would think that, uh, you know, international laws would be binding on U.S. courts, which according to, according to Article 6, Section 2 of the Constitution, it says that uh, any international law or treaty that the United States is party to is the supreme law of the land and should be binding on all courts. And whenever we, we make that point in a courtroom, we're, we're, we're objected to and we're denied. Who is your attorney? So, uh, Was Francis Boyle your attorney? Well, no. Francis Boyle has been called on at different times in Pasha's cases to uh, offer expert uh, testimony right. on, on international law and uh, how, how nuclear weapons are in violation of uh, numerous treaties and international laws. And uh, he, he, he's not been allowed to testify under oath before the jury. Yeah, we've, uh, in, in, in he's been a guest states. on our show twice here, and uh, we're a real fan of his work. And in fact, didn't he uh, submit a brief, a, uh, an abacus curia, uh, friend, friend of the court brief uh, to the court? I think it had 26 articles uh um, uh, 26 separate clauses uh, in his brief uh, where uh, he argued that um, many of these points that we're talking about right now. Well, yeah, for sure. Uh, and he, he, uh, he's been doing, he's one of the leaders, of course, in, in trying to get uh, the, uh, the judiciary to take seriously the international laws and treaties that the United States is uh, obligated under. Mm-hmm. Uh, which it, which they signed, and and yet when it comes to uh, the actual uh, uh, applicability of these laws in, in, in U.S. courts, they uh, as I said, they don't want to they don't want to touch it. And uh, you you would think you would think you know whenever I've been to court for Pasha's trial um, or any other act of nonviolent resistance, that you'd be able to state your full motive and intent. Mm-hmm. For why you've acted, right? And our, our friends certainly, you know, they issued an indictment that they took on to the base, uh, Kings Bay, Georgia, and uh, say, stating specifically how the United States is in violation of the Nuremberg Accords. Uh, Martha Hennessy, who is uh, one of the, who was one of the defendants and the granddaughter of Dorothy Day. She was able to read just a short uh, a couple of sentences about uh, the Nuremberg Accords and how their uh, nuclear weapons are in violation of, uh, of those accords. And then also they, brought, uh, they made reference to the new uh, treaty uh, prohibiting the new UN treaty, which prohibits nuclear weapons. And uh, of course, the United States, you know, uh, is is, is uh, completely uh, non-cooperating with this treaty. And uh, this is the the great hope for for survival for our human family. If if uh, fifty countries adopt this new treaty to prohibit nuclear weapons, then it becomes binding on all the countries of the world. Art- but the United States. Uh, 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 keep stonewalling, and they keep uh, uh, expanding the nuclear arsenal to the point where now, over the next 30 years, uh, there's an estimated $1.5 trillion that's uh, being earmarked to upgrade the U.S. nuclear arsenal. And that came under the uh, the Obama administration. Uh, if if, any, if anyone Correct. thinks that he was some kind of a peacenik, uh, think again. Um uh, he Obama was as bad as every other president. Art, I want to I want to take the um, I want to take the the devil's advocate position here for a second. Uh, I lived in uh, the Colorado Springs area for years. I was at uh, General Cooler's retirement at Peterson Air Force Base before he was promoted to commander of U.S. Stratcom. 
and uh, and I, I was also uh, I also attended uh, General Hyten's uh, c confirmation as the current um, uh, U.S. Stratcom commander, um, and both uh, Cooler and Hyten are. Um, I want to say they've they've departed from the norm from the, from the tradition of well the president is the commander in chief and in the chain of command we just blindly obey whatever our superior um, officer or commander tells us to do so if the um, if the command is to launch a preemptive nuclear strike an unprovoked strike uh, well that's that's what we do because we're uh, military officers, and that's what we're sworn to do. But General Hyten and General Cooler have both said their their oath of office as military officers is not to the president, but to the Constitution, and that is to uh, is to uh, fight all uh, uh, enemies, domestic and foreign. And our own president can be a domestic enemy, and to obey the Constitution that that they have to. They can only carry through on and execute legal orders. And General Hyten has gone on uh, record twice. Once during his confirmation hearing, when um, when he was asked questions by uh, both uh, senators, uh, Democrats, and 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 Trump's fellow Republicans in his confirmation uh, hearing about Trump's authority to wage war and use nuclear weapons or enter into um, international conflict uh, with uh, unprovoked tactical nuclear strikes. And then again, uh, the, the general in a second time uh, was asked about the, the same question about uh, at the Halifax um, uh, uh, International Security Conference, again, whether he would obey uh, an, an illegal unprovoked order for a, for a, a tactical nuclear strike he said no he said he would consult he would do with what any CEO would do he would consult his attorney he would consult the JAG the Judicial Advocates General Office of the Air Force the General Hyten says he has attorneys of his own Air Force Air Force attorneys who will say that if the president is incapacitated insane crazy drunk um you know uh, in a, all of the above all of the above in an <laughs> epileptic rage whatever uh, but if the order is illegal to launch a unprovoked tactical preemptory nuclear strike he would he would not obey that order if his attorneys said not to do you take any comfort in that Well, we've been advocating for uh, you know, for all these years. There've been uh, uh, since 1980. You know, there there have been uh, over a hundred plowshares actions that have happened in the U.S. and internationally. And in all these actions, and in all the other actions that uh, people have been taking to abolish nuclear weapons, that's always the hope and prayer that you know that if an order were to come down, that. Uh, the military chain of command that people would refuse the order to uh, carry it out. Um, right now, uh, I think there's one very encouraging thing that happened. Uh, last year, uh, Pope Francis actually said that we that we can no longer possess nuclear weapons. It's it's prohibited. The first time anybody any any church uh, uh, official in the Catholic Church made a statement like that that. Uh, that, that we can't possess them. If we can't possess nuclear weapons, that means we can't use them, we can't participate in any decision-making process that would allow them to ever be used or built. Right. And so uh, we, we vigil at the, uh, our, our Catholic worker community here in Washington, we vigil at the Pentagon every Monday morning. The vigil's been going on since 1987. And we are always appealing to the generals and to everybody going into that center of war making on our planet to refuse orders to kill, refuse orders to carry out um, uh, any any order that would would involve the indiscriminate destruction of uh, of uh, civilians and populations. Uh, we we hope and pray that by our actions and, and you know it's really a, a prayer that 
somehow uh, people's hearts will be changed and they'll refuse to participate in this insanity. The bulletin of the atomic scientists have turned their doomsday clock to two minutes to midnight because of the, the uh, twin uh, threats of climate crisis and nuclear war. And we have to do everything we can as, as human beings to to uh, uh, end the climate crisis and to abolish nuclear weapons. Art, the two go hand in hand. Art, you, uh, this past August, you wrote an article, uh, Repent, Remember, Resist, 74 years since the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. You quote Thomas Merton. You talk about... Um, you know, the bomb being dropped on Hiroshima, and then three days later, another nuclear weapon was dropped. Here it is, 74 years later. What have we learned? Well, I think uh, from uh, 40 years ago, the, uh, there's, there's a, a stronger uh, movement worldwide to abolish nuclear weapons. Um, and that's partly evidenced by the great work of the uh, of ICANN, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, that right. won the Nobel Peace Prize right. uh, two years ago. And, uh, you know, the Hibakusha, the Hiroshima uh, A-bomb survivors, uh, are always telling us that uh, humanity cannot coexist with nuclear weapons. Hmm. And uh, we, we, we have to heed their plea. Right. Uh, and and seventy four years into the nuclear age, uh, we're, we're as Einstein said when the atom was split and the bomb uh, was was tested, uh, everything in history changed except our way of thinking, and we drift toward an parallel catastrophe. That's Einstein's words, and we continue to drift toward an parallel catastrophe uh, because of the failure of. Uh, of lawmakers and the military and politicians uh, uh, to uh, abolish these weapons of mass murder. And so uh, uh, the plowshares uh, communities over these 39 years and, and many other disarmament activists, you know, have, uh, uh, have, have uh, kept vigil, have, uh, have kept acting, and, and we keep acting. Mm -hmm. uh, knowing, knowing that uh, uh, if we don't act, then we uh, are facing this uh, uh, unparalleled catastrophe that Einstein warned us about. Do you think and that so the choice, the choice before us, the choice before us, as Doctor King said, it's it's nonviolence or non-existence. Do you think we were to resolve our differences through diplomacy and nonviolent means, or we will perish as fools? How likely is it that you think the United States can recover any moral standing uh, given all the 6,000 or so nuclear weapons we, we hold and, and all the escalation in the Middle East? Do you think it's possible? You must if you keep keep at it, huh? Well, well, I, I, I have great faith and hope in, in, uh, in, in, in our human family. Uh, uh, all over the world, people are doing uh, great things for justice and peace and for the for the earth and the environment for human rights uh, every, everywhere the, the evil abounds uh, people are nonviolently uh, resisting and, and holding up a message of hope and, and, and love and justice and I, I am hopeful I am hopeful and uh, for, for these seven uh, posture friends that acted on April 4th uh, 2018, on the 50th anniversary of Dr. King's assassination, they 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 uh, took a great risk uh, for uh, for humanity to say that uh, we have to disarm these weapons of mass murder. And uh, and not only not only do the weapons represent a, you know a threat to the survival of the planet, but even when they're not used, you know we're 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 uh, taking resources. Uh, from uh, all the the vital human needs programs in our country and worldwide, right? And we're placing placing that money and resources into these weapons that can destroy all life on the planet, and uh, and so we we we, we have to uh, 
change our way of thinking. We, we, we have to embrace a new paradigm of, of nonviolence. And, uh, and, and, and Dr. King showed us what that means. You know, we have to resist the triple evils of, of poverty, oppression, and economic exploitation, racism, and militarism, and now environmental destruction. Mm -hmm. You know, Art, it's um, ironic. I'm just uh, looking at my phone here, and as we're um, speaking on the air, I just got an email, a, a uh, a blast from the Voices for Creative Nonviolence about the Kings Bay Plowshare 7 and what next steps to take. So for our listeners, you can just go to uh, their site and they suggest um, several co uh, courses of action. Send letters to the editor of your local newspaper. Send a letter of recommendation to the judge. And they, have, uh, they suggest templates as well as donate. Uh, and uh, they have here greetings from uh, Liz McAllister, birthday greetings. Her birthday is, um, of course, she was one of uh, the Bergen Brothers uh, cohorts. Uh, her birthday is November 17th. I also want to mention that today today is Veterans Day, I think. No, next Monday. Next Monday is. Um, so uh, the, uh, the voices for... Um, for uh, for uh, creative uh, nonviolence uh, is a great site to see what the next uh, actions are. Art, I wanted to ask you one question: What would you say to those your critics uh, who would argue that the United States needs a strong nuclear posture um, uh, in the face of North Korea? Um, and, uh, and and other countries, rogue countries, even Pakistan now and India and their border war, Israel, of course, secret nuclear uh, nation, but especially North Korea in developing their own nuclear arsenal, that we need to take a position of strength. Um, that's their argument. What would you say to them? Well, here, here again, you know, uh, we, I come at this from uh, uh, a faith uh, perspective and uh, God calls us to beat all the swords of our time into plowshares. And that's the motivation for the plowshares' actions. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation. Never again shall they train for war. And that's, that's the vision. That's the, that, that's the, uh, that is the mandate that we have from, uh, from our creator. And, uh, and so when, when Dr. King was addressing the issue, he, he, he said, you know, uh, you know uh, we have a choice. You know, we can either follow uh, the path of nuclear annihilation or we come to our senses and we say, you know, whatever differences there are in the, in the world between nations, we, we settle them through nonviolent diplomatic means. Art, we... Or we will destroy us, or, or we'll destroy ourselves, which we're doing. Right. Art... We're... we're, we're, we're uh, how many, how many early deaths have there been, you know, as a result of uh, nuclear testing? You know, people dying from cancer and leukemia and other diseases. You know, how many people have, how many poor of our world have died early deaths as a result of all the misplaced resources going into the, the military? Over $10 trillion since the nuclear age began has been spent on nuclear weapons in the United States alone. Think of how all that money could be used to eradicate poverty in our world, you know? Art, you uh, have been, uh, I opened all of our eyes. I wanted to mention I've already signed uh, signed the petition on your website. Can you give the website for our viewer, for our listeners, rather, who would like to help those seven folks out? Well, it's the uh, kingsbayposture7.org. Wonderful. Very simple. kingsbayposture7.org. And you can go there, you can sign a petition, you get all the information you need about the case, mm -hmm. about what they're facing. There's no sentencing day yet, but that will right. be posted soon when we, when we hear from the court. Um, and uh, there are, there are uh, many, uh, there are links to many groups, including uh, Voices uh, for Creative Nonviolence. I, I, I hold them in great esteem. I'm very good friends with Kathy Kelly. I, Thank God for Kathy Kelly and for all the great work that Voices uh, for Creative Nonviolence is doing. Thank you, Art. Um, 
we really, really appreciate your, your visiting with us these 30 minutes. Art Laffin has been an organizer, writer, speaker, and faith-based movement for peace and justice for over 20 years. He currently is a member of the Dorothy Day Catholic Worker House of Hospitality in Washington, D.C. That's today's program. Please uh, visit our website for archives of today, today's and all programs. Thank you. Thank you for listening.